Dr. D Flow. Hello, my name is Dr. D Flow, and welcome to the J Design. This system can easily power hundreds or even thousands of LEDs. Make sure you watch the overview video for an introduction to this design. In this video, we will be building the controller board. In the next video, the driver board. Dan Julio is the mastermind, and I want to thank him for making this design open source. As a reminder, one controller board powers four driver boards, which can each drive 128 LEDs. Therefore, you will need a controller board every 512 LEDs. I have two boards. All the supplies needed are listed on both danhuliodesigns.com and drdflow.com. Let's get this project started. The first thing we need are schematics. We can download these from Julio's site. These are found in the HW Rev2 zip. Download. Unzip. And open Octo Controller. Double click on the schematic. It may look a little daunting if you are new to electronics, but don't worry, we will get through it together. Now we need to purchase all the parts, so head over to drdflow.com forward slash jdesign. Each controller board is about $60, which is pennies compared to the commercial equipment designed to run adjustable LEDs. First, we need to purchase the brains of the controller board, the fade candy. Luckily, this comes fully assembled. Next, click on the mouser link underneath controller board. This is a list of all the tiny components that will populate the controller board. It even includes the ethernet terminal. All you have to do is click order project and you will have all of the correct components. Now we need to purchase the board to place the components on. Click on the OSH park link. Click order board and create an account. Normally if you want to order a custom PCB, you would have to order hundreds because PCBs are printed on huge panels. But OSH Park is a company that takes designs from many people and assembles them on one panel. So you don't have to purchase 100 boards, but you still have to purchase a minimum of three boards, which is annoying if you're working with under 512 LEDs. I wouldn't check out yet because we will be purchasing the driver boards from OSH Park as well in the next video. While some people may be able to hand solder these surface mount components, I highly recommend using reflow soldering. With reflow soldering, you have a sticky mixture of solder and flux which you spread across the contact pads of the PCB. You place the component on top of this paste, heat up the board, and all the components will be soldered to the board. A stencil is used to make sure that the solder paste touches only the contact pads and not the rest of the PCB. Go back to my website and click on OSH Stencil, Add Stencil, Create an Account, Click on the stencil under projects. The 3 mil polyamide film is fine. Add stencil to cart. I would also purchase a 1 16th acrylic jig set and lead free solder paste if they have it in stock. Currently they do not, so you can purchase it from Amazon. I wouldn't check out yet because in the next video, when we're working on the driver board, we will also need a stencil from OSH Stencil. At some point, you will need to buy a 24 volt, 350 watt DC power supply. This power supply is a little pricey at $50, but trust me, you do not want to buy a cheap, unstable power supply. It's important to wait for all of your components before building. Some of the electronics are sensitive to moisture, so once you open the package, you have a limited amount of time to reflow solder them. After reflowing, atmospheric moisture is not a concern. All right, let's put this board together. As you saw before, we need to apply the solder paste to only the contact pads. Secure the controller PCB with the acrylic jig. Put the stencil on top. Apply a very generous amount of paste to the back of a card. Spread the card across the stencil at a 45 degree angle. Make a second pass at 90 degrees to remove the excess paste. Lift up the stencil from one side. 
thoroughly inspect that no two contact pads have been bridged by the solder. If they are, you can easily wipe the solder paste off the board and try again. Now we need to place the components on the board, but how do we know which components go where? First, you look at the white ink on the PCB. These two pads are for component C1. The C, of course, stands for capacitor. So next we check the schematic. We find C1 and we see that it is a 4.7 microfarad capacitor. I would then search 4.7 on the Mouser project list and find the Mouser number. In this case, it's 81, GRM31, etc. And then find the bag with this Mouser number. I open these bags in a big popcorn bowl because these components are very small and very easy to lose. I then use tweezers to place these components on the board. Most capacitors and resistors are non-directional, which means that the C1 capacitor could be placed either of the two ways on the two pads. However, the large polymer capacitors, D and U components are polar. These components minus the capacitors are also sensitive to static, so I wouldn't work on a carpet. I will display the component type and mouser number on the screen as I place them. I will interrupt if the component is directional. Good luck! The next component we will be placing is the TVS diode, which provides ESD protection for the circuit. We will place 8 of them, all at the top of the board, D3 through D10. These components are polar, however, since they are three-pronged, there is only one orientation to place them. Next we are going to place D1, which is a larger TVS diode. This component is polar, and can be placed incorrectly. There should be a white line on one end of the top of this diode. Whoever's in charge of making sure these white lines are properly printed should be fired. This line was so faint on all of my diodes, I almost had to guess which side it was on. So this might be the case for you too. This line is the cathode band. And on the PCB, there should be a C on one side of the D1, which stands for cathode, and an A on the other side, which stands for anode. You want to place this component so that the white line is closest to the C. Next, we have to place the green diode, or D11. This will illuminate when the board is on. The green diode is also polar and can be placed incorrectly. On the bottom of the green diode is a green arrow. There is also a negative sign on the board. The arrow should point towards the negative sign. This is a little awkward because you have to flip the diode back over to place it but there are small green polarity markings on the front of the LED in two corners. These should be on the same side as the negative. D2 is also polar. Remember, white line goes with C. Next, we are going to place U1 and U2, the drivers responsible for the differential signaling. These spiders can be placed in two different orientations, but only one is correct. These boards can either have a white line or a dot on top. Either way, this mark should be placed on the same side as the white circle on the PCB. The last two components to be placed are the digital isolators U3 and U4. These components had a small circle instead of the usual line. 
This circle should be placed on the same side as the circle imprinted on the PCB. Now it's time to reflow. Melting the solder will create a permanent and conductive joint between the component and the board. I use my stove, but an old toaster oven would be ideal. You don't want to just crank the heat up, you want to try and achieve a linear increase in temperature. I will link a reflow guide in the description. Once all these joints turn silver, take the board off the heat source and let it cool. Next we need to hand solder a DC-DC converter to the board, which I assume is to power some of the drivers on the board. Direction does matter for this component, but it's self-explanatory with the outline rectangles on the board. Make sure the component does not move after you finish soldering, or else you could have a weak or non-existent connection to the board. Attach the Ethernet terminals by snapping them into place. Don't forget to flip over the board and solder them. Be very careful not to bridge connections because this is a great way to fry both your driver and controller board by bridging data and your power. Also, if you find that only some of your LEDs work, it may be because your solder connections for the ethernet pins are weak, so checking these is a good troubleshooting step if anything were to go wrong. Next, attach the screw terminal, which will be the input for the 12 volts from the power supply. These are large contact pads, so use a generous amount of solder. This next step is kind of weird, but don't forget it. We need to connect the VUSB pad on the bottom of the fade candy to the USB VCC on the board. According to Julio, this provides power for the fade candy half of the isolator chips U3 and U4. Be careful with this wire as you position the fade candy to be soldered. Next, I used male pins to solder the fade candy to the board. And that's it, you built the controller board. In the next video, we will build the driver board, and in the third and final, we will put everything together and 3D print some cases. Thanks for watching, I will see you next video.